a good cameraman? All right. He's not as good looking, so. The <laughs> I was saying we have a new camera person. So no, the, <laughs> I was just saying it's good looking. I was saying, but not as. Unless, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Guy 3 is on leave, so. Yeah, that, that's, what, that's what he said. All right, well, shall we get started? Yeah. Just, oh, should we close the door, maybe? <clears throat> oh, sorry. So, um, just one, can you stand like a bit more to the. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, no, I just. I mean, maybe that's up to you. OK. Well done, Amri Tanshu. Okay, I'm going to, I think I'm going to s try and get this to actually. Yeah, see, now you made this connection weaker. It's not actually sticking in. Well. All right, we'll have to hope that it works. I won't touch anything. <clears throat> Don't touch anything else. <laughs> All right, hey, Vishwanath. All right, well, welcome to the fifth uh, day of SAGE and programming and computers and mathematics. This is the final day that I will be teaching. After this, we will be having uh, all kinds of other characters talking about algebraic combinatorics and object oriented programming and many other vital topics. Um, so I thought that what I'd do today. Um, since we've already learned a little bit of programming, we've learned a little bit of what Sage can do, and we've learned how to interact and share it, um, that I thought we'd start actually looking at the code. Um, this is a little bit uh, tricky because there's a lot of code in Sage. There we go. But I think that we're ready for it. And of course, uh, for those who are on site, uh, it'll get you ready for Sage Days 60, which is being hosted here by, among others, uh, three of the people in the audience, Sanri Tanshu Prasad, Vishwanath and Nicolas Thierry. So it's kind of exciting to think that we're almost ready. All right. Now, this object-oriented programming business, um, when I publish this and we put the PDF up, you should totally click on the links about object-oriented programming in classes. Structuring programs is really important once you're doing something that's not kind of small and you know just one-off scripts. You want to be able to structure your programming. This is hard, and it's hard to do right. Um, so that's why people have come up with different programming paradigms. And the one that Sage and Python use is this object-oriented paradigm. <clears throat> but I don't think that you can really be ready to do that until you know why it's useful and how it interacts. And so that's why we're going to try and see the code today, um, just to get a sense of how big the structures are and how you can encode at least some mathematical information uh, in some of that structure. Um, so this is, in some ways, although there's the least homework, there's no homework at all uh, from this day, as, as far as I know, um, it's in some ways the hardest because we're going to actually dive into the, the actual code of Sage. But before we do that, I want to hear about your homework from last time. So here's an interact I cooked up for fun, and I wanted to know if anybody had one that they wanted to share. Uh, why is this too big? There we go. How many subgroups of order, uh, how many different subgroups are there of D? Four, for instance. Looks like there's 10 subgroups. So, I'm, so see, and then I just change the order. Maybe I'll do this. Now there are six groups of D3, which is kind of fun, isomorphic to S3. And you see I had to do a little bit more programming shenanigans. Right? Default value. And then I did a couple extra things. And then I did some formatting. So it was all crazy. Here's a little list comprehension. We learned about those. Is anybody brave to share an interact that they wrote for today? It's not working. Ah, uh, yes, getting on Citron from the wireless is not working currently, I believe. So that's one of the problems. Can you at least tell me what kinds of things that you tried to interact with? What kinds graphs. of graphs? So you tried to, and was it any old graph? Just print me all the graphs, or? No, no, so the, given a graph, you try to Ah, I see. So something very high powered. No, but the problem <laughs> is it, it works in a worksheet, but it doesn't work with the stage step. Ah, okay. So that's something we should want to talk about. It should they should work in both. Um, said someone else, Vishwajit, did you uh, come up with an interesting interact? Uh, 
Maybe not. <laughs> no. Okay. So try try them out. Anybody? Yeah. Yes. No. Okay. So what simple functions? Like what did you do? So like plotting or. Okay, yeah, so then that's fine, right? You know, even can you just get it to plot something? It's really valuable to try making these because it helps you understand the structure of just the math programming, right? So even if you do something that's not very deep mathematically, uh, understanding how these interacts work help you start to structure your thinking and say, how do I turn something into a function, right? And that's really the key is can I put everything into some block of information? And that's what we're going to see today. OK, well, I won't. We already saw plenty of interacts yesterday, so I'm not going to bore you by talking more about that. OK, <clears throat> so remember, the goal of the course is not just to help you be able to use SAGE. There are some courses like that out there um, where you like scientific programming or something like that. But we want you to be able to write your own code that could eventually be involved in SAGE itself. That's different from a scientific programming course, right? Um, and so we really want to figure out what is this thing Sage, and figuring out how to go through the Sage code base is going to be really useful. And many of you are doing research in areas where it would be useful to have it, you know, hop algebras, right? Uh, and uh, Amri Tanchu has already contributed some code to Sage and Kanapan as well. Um, so, you know, and of course our guest Nicola has contributed many, many, many lines of code to Sage, um, many of which are actually also useful. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, it, if you want it to be adopted, you want to figure it out. But there is lots and lots of lines of code, right? Just tons and tons of code. And that's just the stuff that's written specifically for Sage. And then there's also thousands and thousands and thousands of lines that wrap <coughs> other, func other functions and other um, open source projects. So I'm going to show you some examples of that. And the question is, how do you see what's new what's wrapping something else, what's giving you access to another program, and how might that all fit together. But you won't be an expert at the end of a one hour course on this, but it's to at least give you a sense of what you're dealing with. What is this monster, this behemoth uh, that's called Sage? So let's look at some graph theory. Everybody likes graphs. Woo. <clears throat> so this Durer graph, you can see it here, is actually implemented directly in Sage. So if I go, so here it is, graphs.durer graph, and there's no umlaut because uh, it has to be ASCII, I guess. And you can see even here that it gives us a little information. If I want a list of a whole bunch of built-in graphs, I type graphs, dot, and then I get all the different graphs that I could possibly want. And then I showed it. So it's a very pretty graph, I think. So if I go and take a look at the code, um, now I have to figure out where it was because This is not my computer, as we always say. How do I find something? OK, do rare. There we go. Def, do our graph. Can everybody see that? Let me see if I can make this a little bigger, a lot bigger. OK, that's good. All right. So oops, do our graph. All right. So there's all kinds of information you can find out about it on Wikipedia. I have no idea why it's named after Albrecht Dürer, but you should all know him anyway, because he's this awesome artist. Um, and so there's different things you can find out about it. And then, so that's all just the documentation, right? So just like you guys did in your homework, def, the thing, there's no input, because there's only one of them. There's not different size Dürer graphs. And then there's these three quotes. And that's where you put the documentation. In this case, there's an R. And that's just so that strange things don't happen with backslashes. And then there's the end. And now take a look at this. Edge dict. And sure enough, oh, I don't have the pointer today. <clears throat> sure enough, the edge dict is a dictionary. Right? Everybody remember dictionaries? They're inside of braces, curly braces. And then each thing, you have a vertex and then a list of the vertices that it connects to, comma, and then so forth. So this is the dictionary of the edges. It's directly implemented in Sage. And then there's pause dict. And it's going to turn out that that's a dictionary of where each vertex will be plotted, uh, just so it's pretty. And then look what we do. Return graph. Graph of what? I put in the dictionary of edges, just like we did the last time we created graphs. And then it turns out that there's this optional argument, pause, position. And I can give that a dictionary of positions. And, it, and then it turns out I can even give it a name. So that's really fancy, right? There's all these optional things that I can do. And that gives me the Dürer graph. So it's very nice. Um, 
And then here's another place that I can see it, of course. I can tab right after the double question mark. Maybe I should have done that instead. All right, same thing. So everything should look pretty straightforward, except there is this black box. And the black box is this graph. So what's up with that? Everything else we know because we already did it before. But that is kind of magical, right? I mean, <clears throat> nobody said that this, uh, this graph had to exist. Let's see if I can scroll back up. My apologies that this is slow. So what is graph? Let's take a look at the code for graph. Graph, question mark, question mark, right? All right then, well, let's see. Documentation, 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 <laughs> examples, examples, more examples. Ah, we finally get to sleep. Whoa, what the heck is this? Def underscore underscore init, self data equals non, pos equals non, loops equals non, format equals non, boundary equals non. And then there's some documentation for that. Oh, great. Well, thanks a lot. And what tons and tons of examples. Generic graph dot in itself, sage dot structure dot element, if sparse equals false, if format equals none. Help. OK, so we need, to, we need to figure out what to do about this. And now it was so long that I actually scrolled all the way down to the bottom of my entire worksheet. So I hope that that gives you the idea that maybe this is not you know, just something that you can just do without thinking about it a little bit. But let's see what it actually did. There were several key parts to that. The first thing was the class. You, you'll notice, and um, it, I, I don't want to do them at the same time, so let's see if I can figure out where this is located. Now, I, I'm not going to... I'm not going to, to do too much. I don't want to have too many windows open at the same time. But if you'll notice that at the very beginning, it didn't say def. It said class graph. That's a big difference, right? Not DEF for defining a function. It's defining what's called a class. You're going to learn what this is later when you talk about object-oriented programming. But for now, what you want to think of it is, is it's a way to make lots of different graphs, but all with the same notation. So you just have to use graph once and any you know, position dictionary you feed in is going to work. Then there's all this documentation. And you notice that the documentation had many examples. Did you see all those examples? There are examples in these two, right? So in the documentation for the Dura graph and all these other graphs, there was also documentation. These examples are actually run every time that Sage is tested. When you test Sage, it runs every single one of these examples to make sure that something isn't weird on your computer, or that you didn't make a change that caused you know, Dura graphs for some reason uh, to not work properly. So that's another key component of it. And then came this weird double underscore init. And I'm going to highlight this for the folks on the, the internet. It was definitely a method. You know, you could do stuff with it, but it, it had all these defaults, right? There was this pause equals none, boundary equals none, loops equals none. What the heck was that all about? And then there was this huge amount of code. And I'm not going to go through that again because it was truly a huge amount of code. But what that code was doing is deciding if you input a graph as a dictionary, how do I handle that? But what if there was another way to input a graph? Well, there's code to handle that too. And in fact, if you look at the graph, and don't do the double question mark, if you just do graph with one question mark, you'll see that there is six or seven different ways to input a graph. And it's going to figure out exactly which one the user has asked for and give it back. And so what we did, when we did graph, and let me just go back up here um, to the code for the Dura graph, when it does graph edge dict pos equals pos dict, what it's doing is it's feeding this init. It's not, it looks like it's going to graph. It's not. It's going to this init thing. And it's feeding it the dictionary of edges. And it's feeding it the dictionary of layout. And that's enough for it to know everything that it needs to know to create the graph. Hey, this is, this is heavy stuff. So any questions in the audience? 
I, I mean, you should have lots of questions, but are, is there anything that I could clarify that at least sort of made sense? Right. So what we're doing whenever we create a new Sage object is we're actually feeding some initialization information. So for a graph, it would be you know, the edges. And then it's going through this long set of code to figure out how to turn those initialization information into an actual graph or an actual group or whatever. So I'm going to tread pretty lightly otherwise. Um, but I really encourage you to start reading through, even now, all these examples. And here's one reason why. Here's a different example. So here we have a tetrahedral graph. And I'm actually going to evaluate this one uh, because we're going to use it again later. So that's a very pretty graph. Uh, unsurprising what a tetrahedral graph will look at. We have all the platonic solids in SAGE. Um, and so I can look at the code for this one. So let's tab. All right, so this again, def tetrahedral graph, just a function. Return a tetrahedral graph. All right, so they do different things. And then look at this. Import network, what? Import network x, what's that? g equals network x dot tetrahedral graph and then return graph g name equals tetrahedral and then they give the position oh, okay so they want it to plot nicely again great well fine so that's kind of different right and the difference lies in these two lines import network x and network x dot tetrahedral graph it, ca it calls the graph constructor and that's the technical name for this business here. But it hasn't created it from scratch. Sage isn't just making it. Instead, it turns out that there's this project called Network X, which is an open source uh, BSD license, for those who care, um, graph libraries. Just anything you want to do about graphs, and in particular networks, which of course is of great interest to many researchers outside of mathematics. And one of the built-in things in this network X is the tetrahedral graph. So thanks to the folks at Los Alamos National Laboratory and thousands probably of open source contributors from around the world, we already have a tetrahedral graph. So why would we make it from scratch in Sage? We should just use the one that's already there in network X. So what we do is we import it, and you'll learn about this in the object-oriented part of the course. We take this thing and say, Sage, use network X. And then we can use it just like any other Python function. So now it looks just like stuff that we've already done in Sage when you are creating groups or something like that. And then the only thing that Sage does additionally is it gives it a name and tells you how to plot it if you want to plot it nicely, which apparently we did, because look at how pretty that is. See? So this is the beginnings of how we do this object-oriented business. There's this initialization. There's a, it's a, you take input information for an object in math. And that could be anything from a very simple object, like a plot, or maybe a graph is not quite as complicated. Or it could be all the way to those right-angled art and groups uh, we were talking about. You feed it that initialization information, or a car carton matrix. We were talking about those, the Biswajit, right? You know, it's, this is what's actually happening under the hood, is you give it you know, carton matrix of A, 3, and 1, and it says, oh, OK, now let's go through a whole bunch of code to decide what object that actually corresponds to. Does that make sense? Right? So that's what's going on here. Um, so that's like another level of abstraction beyond what we've done already. But it allows us to organize things. Right? If you may have noticed, for instance, that um, some of these things, uh, where was the graph? Oh, no, I already got rid of it. But the graph inside the parentheses, it said generic graph. And that's because you could also have directed graphs, right? So maybe we should have different things for directed graphs versus undirected graphs. And we do in Sage. OK, so let's give another example of this. So how about groups? Everybody likes groups. So groups are not exactly implemented natively. It's kind of a blend of Sage and Gap. And if you're not familiar with Gap, uh, I'll just make sure I click on the website. Uh, now the groups algorithms programming, they used to talk about group theory, but now it's computational discrete algebra. So they're trying to broaden their locus. This is a really great program. Um, it, it's venerable. It's been around for a long time. Uh, it's got lots and lots of great stuff. So why not use that as part of Sage? And you'll see that Sage is, as they say, not reinventing the wheel, uh, but building the car. So we take the best open source components and put them together and try to unify their notation. So let's create a group. 
So I'm going to create a permutation group with generators 1, 2, 3, and 2, 3, 4. And of course, those two uh, don't commute, so this will be a non abelian group. And you see, when I say put type P, it gives me this really long, crazy thing. Class sage.groups.permgroups.permgroup dot permutation group generic with category. Whew. All right. So there's somebody in the audience who knows about these things. Uh, the, uh, suffice to say that we're trying to really narrow down exactly how we're representing this group. Now, I haven't actually used gap yet. If I was at the command line, uh, and I've put in this example here, you see that if I do this on the command line, and I exit Sage immediately. I do con con control D. It just says exiting Sage. I haven't actually used gap yet. Inside of Sage, a constructor, just like the one for the graphs, has taken these permutation things and it said, OK, here's a Python thing that represents this group. And even if I want the generators, well, we already gave it the generators, so it doesn't need to use anything else for that. But if I want a non-trivial computation, then I'm going to have to use GAP, because GAP is what we use to do interesting group theory computations. And we call this a wrapper. And so I'm going to click Evaluate just to confirm. And the subgroup of this permutation group uh, that is the center, as you can see, is the trivial group. So this has a trivial center, okay. highly non-abelian. And you can see the command line version of this, p.center. And then when I exited Sage, it says exiting spawned gap process. So now you see how Sage is starting to work together with other, other projects. Not, and gap is not written in Python, right? Uh, I don't even know what it's written in C, I guess. But I, um, so this is really, really different. But they work together nicely, and the, there's a unified, um, oops, uh, no, that wasn't the one I wanted, sorry. There's a unified syntax. Not my computer. OK, if we take a look at the code, you'll see it says self.subgroup, gap group equals self.underscore gap.center. OK, so it's clearly using gap right here. Okay. But that's OK, because we want it to be available inside of Sage. You don't want to have to always use exact gap syntax in order to get some property of a group. It might be useful to just have some Sage wrapper around that. Um, and so that's what we're going to do. So now what we're going to do is we're actually going to dive in. Uh, and this is going to be scary uh, to see how a Sage creates a group. Do not expect to follow what we're about to do, all right? It's going to be crazy. But I just want you to see that the full structure is really in there. And you're going to start seeing where your ideas might fit in. Okay? This is going to be pretty crazy. Now, this is actually from the documentation. Alternating group 1, 2, 4, 5. Everybody remembers that everything that comes after the hash mark is comment, right? right? So it doesn't count. It's not going to cause an error. Okay, G equals the alternating group with 1, 2, 4, and 5. So that's kind of odd. What's the 1, 2, 4, 5? So what I can do is I can actually search the source for alternating group. And so there's this search underscore src, which uh, my browser says is bad typing. So it's underlining it in red. What that does is it finds all the files where you might find exactly spelled this way, alternating group, with this upper and lower case. And sure enough, there's a lot of places where alternating groups are done. And in particular, this perm group named.py is going to be the one uh, that's most useful. There's also a command that's, if you're looking for a function and you want to find out stuff about it, I could do search def. But alternating group wasn't a function, right? It, didn't, it, it was just a, a thing, it was an object. So I can't use it in this particular case. So if I click on that, I get the Sage source browser for that. And now, if I can figure out how to search for things on this computer, Control F maybe? Maybe not. Alt F? No. Hmm. All right, maybe it's at the bottom of the browser. I'll just hope it's there. OK, there's alternating group. Alternating group. Ah, there it is. Class, alternate group. Look, again, class. There's initialization. Domain equals none. 
So you saw how in the previous thing there was this mysterious thing where I did an alternating group and I said that I wanted one, two, four, five. Okay, that that's that's a an alternate input, right? And there it is. Domain, and in this case the default is none. Let's see if the documentation tells me anything about this. Oh yeah, here it is. Alternating group one, two, four, five. So those are the elements. It's the alternating group with four, but instead of being one, two, three, four, it's doing it on one, two, four, five. That may seem really dumb, right? But you can imagine a case where you might have an alternating group with different, you know, things that you're permuting. Maybe you want one that permutes one, two, four, five, another one that permutes one, two, three, five, and then you want to see what their intersection is or something. Yeah, so that seems reasonable. And then let's take a look at the whole code. This is the entire code of this. Wow, it's so easy to create an alternating group. I just find a permutation group underscore sim alt, whatever that is, and I initialize that. Hmm. That doesn't seem very helpful. Let's see if I can find that guy. All right, so let's, ah, no, I need the invisible. Now let's see if I can find, oh good, there's this class, great. All right, so let's, let's see, the alternating group comes from this. What does an sim alt? Let's see, let's read the documentation. This is a class used to factor out some of the commonality in the symmetric group and alternating group classes. That's true, symmetric groups and alternating groups have a lot of things in common, right? Such as every alternating group is a subset of a symmetric group. But there's other things they have in common too, right? Okay, all right. And let's see if we can find the initialization guy for this one. Um, no, there's just this mysterious class call, class domain. Uh, oh, wait, yeah, no, I don't know what this is. This is confusing, right? I don't know what to do with this guy. So maybe it just, maybe we'll have to go up another level. See, we're going down the rabbit hole. Right? Alice in Wonderland, we're just going to go deeper and deeper and deeper until we find something that actually tells us something. So let's do permutation group unique. Nope. There we go. So we had permutation group unique. You see a lot of things depend on this permutation group unique. Oh, there it is, at the very top. Whoa, what the heck is all that stuff? Oh my lord. Import, 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 import. Are those really all things that I need to create groups? Answer, yes. <laughs> if you want to do it right. So how do we do a permutation group unique? Uh, once again. There's this class call, an ek, and that's it. Doesn't really do a lot. It seems like it just, yeah, return super permutation group unique class dot class call, yeah. All right, gotta follow it even further. What's a permutation group generic? Now, before we do too much here, you can see this line. Ah, so this will not be in the same file. Now I'm going to have to leave this file in order to do it. I know the people in internet land, it doesn't seem that exciting, and the people here it isn't, but really it is, because we're following the trail to see the construction of an entire structure. It's just like maybe you know the first time uh, you ever realized that there was something more general than a group and something more specific. The groups were less general than like, semi-groups, or magmas or something like that. And then you realize that there's groups, but then there's rings, there's abelian groups, there's fields. And so you're just kind of seeing this whole hierarchy. And so we have to figure out where this guy is. So I have to go to perm .perm group, which this file is not. And so I can browse the directory. And let's see if I can, oh, there's perm group up high. Okay. And if I go down just a little ways, hopefully it'll be right there. And maybe it's not. There we go, permutation group. Is this what I had? Or did I have permutation group generic? I already forgot. Nicola, do you remember what I was doing? No? OK. Well, we'll just go to this one. Permutation group. And you can see that, ah, uh, here, no, here it was. Permutation group generic 
And even that is coming from group.group. .group. But this one does have an initialization. And you can see that finally, wow, they import a lot of other stuff. Handle the case where only the gap group is specified. Oh, I can take a gap group and put it directly inside of Sage. OK, what if the domain is none? Then they just decide what you want to do. What if there is a domain for your permutation group? Well, we did, one, two, four, five. Ah, if domain is not in finite enumerated sets. Oh, great, and look at this. It gives itself some information. Self dot underscore domain equals, remember that was one, two, four, five. So at this point, after I've gone up about three levels, it finally says, yes, I'm going to give my new thing I'm creating some information about itself. It's about one, two, four, five. Not one, two, three, four. And it'll always be ready. Self dot degree, length of, okay, so that'll be four. And then they just give you the generators. And notice it still isn't actually doing anything inside of gap. That's how it creates it. I know this was a long thing to go through. But by following the code, by knowing how to search for different things, you can actually go all the way up. And this is actually pretty much what it does. There's nothing, all these things here, they're just setting what are called uh, attributes. It's, th these aren't functions. It's not doing anything. Right? It's, it's not, there's, nothing, there's nowhere further up the, the tree that it goes. We've reached the top of the tree. Okay, there's all these little Python things that it puts in, and that's how it creates the group. But you saw that in order to structuralize, to distinguish between symmetric groups and alternating groups and just generic permutation groups, we had to go all the way up to this point. Well, if it wasn't exciting for you, it was exciting for me that this actually worked. It was a little bit of an experiment uh, to see if it went. And you can see that this was part of the problem, right? If I looked immediately for this permutation group underscore sim alt, and then I tried to tab complete for it, I wouldn't have gotten it. Now, eventually, we did get to the generic, but we didn't know that starting out. So it's key to be able to actually follow the code and not just guess, basically. Because then you're going to get lost in a hopeless tangle of thousands of files. Um, but you can find it. All right. So as I say, yikes. Are you familiar with yikes? Yeah, oh, yikes. It means it's scary. Now, if I need gap functionality, there's a method for that. Is there something that isn't wrapped? This is one of the great things about Sage. Apparently, P Central series are not actually in Sage, but they're in gap. So if I want the P Central series, oh, well, that wasn't very interesting. OK. But it could have been, right? And so we have access to all those things because Sage isn't just borrowing from Gap, it's including Gap. And so if there's something you need inside of it, you can do it. Now, okay, take a quick stretch break, all right? Those of you at home, you can just for fast forward through the next 30 seconds. Stretch break. I can tell this was pretty intense. Take your stretch break. I'll take a drink. And we're back. So the beauty of all this is that you can actually combine things that otherwise are not going to be connected. So let's do this. I think this example really is going to speak for itself. I put um, comments for each of these things to show what we're doing. Remember, we have the tetrahedral graph. That's a network X graph. That's not directly implemented in Sage. Next, Sage has a Cartesian product functionality. You can take the Cartesian product of two graphs. Let's plot it. This uses what's called matplotlib, uh, which is another open source Python based project. By the way, if I don't like the plot, I can keep on going back and redoing it until it looks the way I want it to. Or I could specify position dictionary. That one's not too bad. See, I don't want to have all those edges so close to each other, but whatever. Now, believe it or not, creating the automorphism group still doesn't use gap. It's using a C backend for graphs. So Sage has many ways of creating graphs. And one of them actually is compiled. It uses the language C to figure out how to make them really fast. There are some people in computational physics who need to look at a lot of graphs really fast in order to do some string theory stuff. I don't know anything about it. But I know that they did need really fast graphs. And that's why we implemented this. Now I'm going to use gap. Can I list all the elements? See, the automorphism group just gives me generators. 
but who says what the relations between the generators are. That's what gap is going to tell us. All right, well, that's a pretty big symmetry group, isn't it? And, you know, this is a highly symmetric graph, so it's not surprising that there is a lot of symmetries. Now I'm going to get this P central series, and once again, it's going to be empty. And that's directly inside of GAP. So you see we have GAP, we have Matplotlib, we have Network X, we have Sage. We use GAP directly, we use it implicitly. All of these things happen within the Sage ecosystem. And depending on what you want to do, some of those will be more efficient than others. Some will make more, more sense than others. Um, if people really wanted some of these more specific group theory things directly within Sage, we would provide them. For most people, it's probably by the time you're that good at group theory, then you probably just can use GAP directly from the Sage thing, right? You're not doing that in your first undergraduate course. All right. Here's another reason why it's important to be able to follow the code. I'm not going to do a lot with this. You want to be able to follow errors. Now, none of you are ever going to feed in bad input or make a typo or anything like that. That's never going to happen to any of you, right? <laughs> Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. But it's quite likely that you'll find some errors in Sage or some things that Sage just can't do yet. So here's an example of this. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this graph. And I'm going to Cartesian product that graph with itself. It's trace back. What? What does that mean? If I click, I look at the, oops, I have to click on it. There you go. If I look, file, cache, oh my gosh, I can't, ah, runtime error, gap produced error output error exceeded the permitted memory. All right, well, that's at least fairly straightforward. Now I have to figure out how to increase the memory that gap gets. Apparently it was just too big of a graph. Hmm. Oh, well, or too big of a symmetric group. But that's okay. So at least now I know I can do something with that. Whoop. I could also do something that doesn't exist. Maybe some groups have the joke method. I don't know what that method is, but maybe some groups have the joke method. But this group does not have the joke method. Whoa. Trace back. Attribute error, permutation group generic with category object has no attribute joke. Okay. So that's important to know. How would we follow that through, right? So being able to go through the code, you would see, oh, here's the place where the joke method is and it just didn't happen to make it to this particular kind of group, okay? This other, I'm not gonna follow a traceback all the way through because you would have to find a very carefully constructed traceback error message for us to actually do it together. Um, and in that case, probably I would just want to fix the bug. But in principle, this might happen to you, if you because even if you guys are faultless, Sage isn't. And neither is any other mathematics software, in case you were wondering. Okay, wow, so we had all this code. Raise your hand if this seems like a lot of code. Okay, all right, see even Nicolas says it's a lot of code, all right, yeah. No, Conifon, you don't think it's a lot of code? I mean, it, it does have all of group theory in it, right, I understand, right. So how do you keep track of all this code? So for the rest of today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about that as well. How does Sage do it? We're not gonna actually do it, but we're gonna talk about how Sage does it. So there's two pieces of this. The first thing is obvious, I hope. The Sage source is organized in a huge tree of functionality. Um, so if we open this up, you can see here is, there's actually even more than this that's uh, not mathematical, but here's all the mathematical stuff in Sage. Calculus, categories, coding, where by coding we mean like, you know, leech lattices and things like that. Um, cryptography, dynamics, game theory is a brand new piece to Sage, it's very exciting. Games is different from game theory, that's like Sudoku's. Homology, matroids, monoids, quadratic forms, quivers, rings, abelian sand piles, if you like those. Lots and lots and lots and lots of stuff. And then inside of each of these, so if we go inside the quadratic forms directory, you see there's, that's appropriate for today since uh, Manjul Bhargava is one of the recent Fields medalists uh, from yesterday, I guess, um, does a lot of quadratic form stuff. So you can see that there's a lot of things. And then I can dive even deeper into the genera. And then here there's not too much. And then I can actually look at it. And you see there's a nice place to view this on the web as well as within your own Sage browser. 
So this one was within uh, your notebook browser. I go to the top. Uh-oh. That's not a good sign. So uh, we may have to do the rest of the talk uh, <clears throat> without the computer. Oh, it froze. Yeah, it froze. So maybe you can get uh, our little buddy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, we'll keep talking uh, well, since the camera is running. How do you keep track of all this code is the other problem. And so the way you do it, actually one thing I could do is get my own computer. Or if, uh, that would be a way to do it. Sage has this large thing. Amri, can you actually go get my computer? Um, from, and and my, the, I need the dongle as well. I don't think so. I, there's this whole system of how we keep track of the code. And so one thing that we need is an overarching way to keep track of discussions, about enhancements, about fixing bugs, about all kinds of other things. And the way we do this, and you can't see this right now, of course, because we have this frozen screen, uh, is via a server called TRAC, T-R-A-C and via a, what's called a revision control system called Git. And I was going to show you a live example, and we'll see if that works or not. So the point of it is that, first of all, what if you have a great idea? I want to implement Hopf algebras, right? That's your great idea. And then you realize, oh, I don't have time to implement Hopf algebras, or I don't know enough about Sage, or you know, whatever. But you can still open a ticket. It's possible to acquire a, uh, a login for the server we, for spam purposes, you can't just have anybody doing it. And then all you have to do, open a ticket that says implement Hopf algebras. Or maybe implement one specific Hopf algebra, right? Maybe that's easier, right? Instead of like implement all of Hopf algebras and co-algebras and bi-algebras and everything, you know, that would be really crazy, right? Or you could open several tickets for each of those. And then people could start discussing them. Great. So let's fix this. So people could start discussing these things. Where's my dongle? I can't do much without that. Oh, you're just going to give me that one? Oh, that's fine, too. Yeah, great. great. It should have been right there. So what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to keep track of a whole discussion. Now, there are some tickets which have huge discussions of very small technical matters. And Nicola is laughing, but it's OK. Sometimes there's personalities involved, of course. But a lot of times, it's just, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. You know, if you want to implement something really cool, then you got to do a lot. And as it just so happens, look at that. It was already ready for us. Uh, except this is, yes, this is the one. So let's go down. Where are we? Great, keeping track. So in order to think about this, I want to tell this little story. So, so just having a place to discuss it is fine, right? That's great. But why do we have to keep track of the actual changes? Can't we just add to Sage and be happy, make it better? So here's my story. Imagine you're writing a paper. And so you write a little boilerplate, maybe you're the author and title or something, you just dive in. And then halfway through, you really need a collaborator. So you add her, right? You guys work together. You send emails back and forth, you've got the tech file attached, you know, and you, you know, or if it's a Word document or whatever. And then after a while, you realize, you know, you and the collaborator are actually writing two separate papers that could really be, you know, detached from each other. Like you've basically proved all of one kind of theorem, and they've proved all the other kinds of theorems. And maybe there's even a third paper that combines them. The problem is you don't remember who wrote what. So now you have to put both names on both papers. Now I know for like, you know, promotion purposes, this is probably a good thing. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but being not cynical about this, it's corny, but it really does matter who does what, right? You want to be able to keep track of who did things. That could be for assigning credit. It could be for assigning blame. <laughs> so some of you may be familiar with the heart bleed bug, uh, which was recently discovered. And I feel really bad for the guy who did it, because now the entire world, it's like, you've made the internet insecure. And that's oversimplifying things. 
But it is important to know because that person, for instance, may be able to suggest a fix. Maybe they're an expert in it. Can you find out exactly when a particular bug crept in, right? So with the keeping track of exactly when these things changed, they could say, open SSL before this version, that one's OK. It doesn't have it. After this version, it's OK. We fixed it. Don't use open SSL between these two versions. Um, you might want to also be able to allow people to work independently and then bring their changes together. So you guys are working on this paper, and you say, you know what, I'm going on vacation, or something, you know, or maybe I'm in some place that doesn't have internet access, or I just don't feel like checking my email. You know that? I just don't feel like it. And then you work on it independently. And at the end, you want to be able to, to put those changes together, to merge them in some sense. And if you can keep track of all the different changes, you can identify exactly which ones are a barrier. Maybe one of you insists on using backslash math frac, and the other one really insists on using backslash math BB for all your different LaTeXing things and you know whatever. Um, also, preserving a record is really important. When it's two people with a paper, it's not so important. But if you have a large project, preserving a record of the history, what if the project leader quits or dies, as has happened? I mean, then you really want to make sure you're able to keep track of things. You might have some reasons, too. So let's take an introduction to this in the last 10 minutes here. So first, there is track. And now that we're on this other computer, um, let's, nah, didn't I just do this? OK. There we go. So this is the Sage uh, track server. And it has all kinds of information. Many, many, many developers. Many, 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 many. Not all of whom are necessarily active, of course. Um, and then lots of links to different things. So for instance, I can view ticket lists. And then I can take a look at you know, which ones are bug mathematically wrong answers. That's always not good. Um, active, so my tickets needing work, my tickets needing review, uh, active bugs, all kinds of different stuff like that. So let's take a look at, whoop. Wow, this is really aggressive. Um, we can take a look at this one, and it'll give me a list of algebra tickets that need work. So they have some work on them, but the work is not um, the best for some reason. So toric divisors from fans and sublattices. Uh, calculus, error when simpe can't evaluate an integral. Integral of sine x over x gives false result. That's not good, right? Um, although I think it turns out the report has a typo, uh, and this was me that did this. Uh, definitely a problem. It's fixed in the latest Maxima. Add doctix to confirm fix. Added three years ago. But then there's something else happening. And then finally Peter Bruin says, oh, here's the problem. There's something about this gamma incomplete. Wow, that's pretty subtle, right? Uh, you wouldn't have expected that to be the problem. But in fact, that's really what's going on. It's much more subtle. It's not as simple as just saying, oh, there's an error. So there's lots of things you can do for easy searching. Here, some random person. Um, wanted to had a click polynomial of a graph. I don't know why he would want that. It's totally useless. Um, but apparently, this guy, Omri, uh, thinks that this is useful. Um, I don't know. Nutsos. Uh, now, again, there are some discussions that are many hundreds of comments long. Some are very short. Um, so here's a nice example of something that just came up. So one person, V. Brown, reported, oh, the OS X app doesn't work on 10.6. So Sage works fine, but there's this extra thing we do to make it nice. So he reports the error. I figured out what caused the error. And then the original author of the app, uh, who's this um, mathematician in, in Hungary, oh, he's American, he figures out what the problem is. And then I continued to test it, and it seems like it works. Um, so that's all good, right? You know, you can really have many people from all around the world at all hours of the day contributing to this. Here's another example of a wiki page. So that's another thing that you can do. Um, and so the Sage Common App, which is what we're going to be doing in the Sage days, it's just coming up. They have a whole progress report. And so you can see here's a roadmap, Hopf algebras. What do you know? So that's part of the, who knew? I actually, this was not planned. Um, so apparently these are all kinds of things that are in here. And um, operads, there's a ticket for that. So maybe there's more for you the next couple of days than you thought, right? Which is great, right? There's this, and that's a really helpful thing to have a wiki. And then you can see, even though it looks like there's a lot still to do, now you can see all the stuff that's been done. And there's actually quite a bit, right? So it's really quite impressive to see how things uh, continue as well. What's that? Yes, it's not up to date. I noticed that. I figured they do it once a year, right? <laughs> once a year they update it. <laughs> All right. Um, now, how do the proposed tickets look? 
our proposed changes. This is another important thing to see. You see how this is a screenshot. There's this UI address track 16796. It's green. Then it says commits. If we actually click on these things, what you see is the actual changes that were suggested. And the red is the stuff that's removed, and the green is what's new. And you can see a lot of it's very similar. I'm pointing to it here, and now I'll go and do it online. You see, this is if rest equals ns modal response. They just change it to ns alert default return. Basically, because older Macs, they don't know what this ns modal response is. They've never heard of this thing. But they do know what this is. And so I can see at one glimpse everything that happened. Right? It's really nice. Now, if it's a huge amount of changes, you might want to break it up into smaller pieces. But the point for us is you can actually see right now what are the changes. That's something that with your programming ability that you already have, you can help on. You can say, oh, yeah, I understand this. I think this is going to work. Now, in order to do this, it is you do need some prerequisites. I can't just start interacting with Sage instead of doing your worksheets. First, I need a command line interface, as I've occasionally demonstrated. So if I go here, right, I need something like this. Okay, You can't really develop without it. Secondly, there is this whole Sage installation guide. I'm not going to click on it, but it tells you how to compile Sage from scratch, to not just download it from somewhere, but to make a new version on your computer that's customized to your computer. And then there's a few prerequisites that you need to work from scratch. On Linux, this is pretty easy to set up, although, unfortunately, we had some problems getting this M4. But usually, it's easy on Linux. On Mac, it's a little more subtle because Mac doesn't trust ordinary users with things like compilers. And so, um, well, But the, the steps are good, and you shouldn't hesitate to ask if you have trouble because they're pretty well understood steps. So then we can do this. Now, once you've made a brand new Sage, you are ready to start making your changes. And so now, actually, I have the terminal, so I'm going to do it. Yes. So I'm going to quit Sage. And I'm going to go into my version of Sage, and I'm going to just mess with something. Um, I'm just going to go in. Let's do um, calculus. Let's see. How about let's just do calculus.py. I'm going to search through, and I'm going to do something horrible. I'm going to make an error. This is not the sum of the reciprocals of the fourth powers, that is zeta of 4, is not 1 over 90 times pi to the fourth. It's 1 over 90 times pi to the fifth. Ha <laughs> ha. I'm going to save it. And then I'm going to do something that makes Sage internalize it, which hopefully won't take too long. And then I'm going to take a look at what change I've actually made. I'm going to check that the change actually happened. What you're going to be seeing is what's called distributed revision control. I'm keeping track of my changes. But there isn't any central place that it has to go. I could just keep track of my changes. In Sage, there is, in practice, a centralized place because we want to say this is the Sage. But in principle, I could just do my own Sage thing and always keep it up to date with the regular Sage. Maybe I don't want to share my Hopf algebra code. I want to make lots of money selling it to somebody else. Actually, you can't do that. That's against the license of Sage. But there are things that I might want to just keep to myself, maybe so I can get better results. Right? I can prove lots of theorems. So if I do this git diff, I will not explain what this is. This is just the way I access it. You can see I access it 190 pi fourth, 190 pi to the fifth. So I have changed it now. And now in order to confirm that I've changed it, I'm going to do this. I'm going to test that file. Because I think that's the right answer. I think Sage is wrong. Let's just see if Sage agrees with me. This is a long file, so it will take a few seconds to do. But it's exciting, because if that's good, then what I can do is I can commit this change. If this is the right thing, if Sage had an error, I could make it a part of my version of Sage. And then I could share it with others using the track server that we were just looking at. Um, wherever it went. Right? Using this server, I could actually share that with others, and then someone could review it and say, you're nuts! I, you expected 1 over 90th time pi to the 5th, but Sage says it's 1 over 90th times pi to the 4th. So if Sage is wrong, you better show why it's wrong. Right? Maybe compare with another system. Maybe give me a theoretical result. 
All right, so I was wrong. I sheepishly admit that I was totally wrong. So I'll look for my pi to the fifth, and I'll move it back humbly to pi to the fourth. If I look at the diff, now there's no diff. There's no differences from the original sage. And I can do this in the background just so that you see that once again everything tests fine. So the Sage Developer Guide has way too much information about how to use this effectively. It requires non-trivial configuration. There's this kind of steep learning curve for in order to do this. We'll save that for some other lecture. I believe Omri is going to uh, talk about that in a week or two. But the point is that because the system is integrated like this, you can keep track of all the changes that people make and integrate it with a peer review system to make a better system. And you are ready to start it. When I started this, I knew nothing about any of these things. No programming. I didn't know anything about revision control. I just followed the steps that were on the website. And I made mistakes. And I got confused. And I asked for help. And my very first contribution, I can remember, was almost completely trivial. I was, trying to, I was, think, I was doing a graph theory course. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll like, have them do some experimentation. I ended up not doing it. I taught it another way. But at the time, I thought I might do it. I was noticing that for degree sequences, there was this extra keyword that seemed unused. That's it. There was like, some keyword in Sage, like you know, length or something. And then when I went and looked at Network X, which is where it was coming from, it was just unused. And I thought, hmm, that's odd. Well, we should probably get rid of those five characters. And it, I emailed the Network X folks, and they said, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's not needed. And so somehow I figured out how to do this stuff with no background. Um, and I put it up, and it got reviewed, and it's in Sage. And I guess I drank the Kool-Aid, as they say, and uh, I haven't looked back. And now I'm doing crazy things like teaching courses on Sage and programming um, in India, which I never expected to do otherwise. Uh, so thank you very much for giving me that opportunity. And uh, I hope you had a good time, and I hope you're ready for Sage Day 60, which starts tomorrow, and uh, which we're going to look at a lot more specific research things and uh, areas that you guys care about. Um, but thanks a lot for the opportunity. Good luck in your Sage careers.